Okay, so just a review of what we were trying to do last Tuesday, if you remember. We had a potential which was periodic. And we said that if the potential is periodic, then the eigenstates, we can always choose the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian to be also eigenstates of the translation by A operator. And hence the wave functions can always be written in the form h power i k times a times some some other function of u. This, this is just a one-dimensional example. And where this u is a periodic function. So basically what's happening is that uh, since the potential is periodic, if you just translate your system, nothing should really be changing. And what the observables are the absolute values. So if you just look at the absolute value of psi, this is nothing but the absolute value of u, which is periodic. So nothing actually changes if you just translate your system. And now we said that let's assume that v is given by some coefficient times the sum of Dirac deltas from minus infinity to plus infinity. This is called a Dirac comb. By the way, this, th this is a Bloch theorem. So we were studying this Dirac comb and trying to identify the band structure. And since u is periodic, we had just assumed that the u to be in the form e to power i pm times x uh, with certain coefficients bm. And then we were trying to determine these bms and uh, construct an eigenvalue equation. And the eigenvalue equation that we had obtained was this one. This is our eigenvalue equation. Now then the question is how we can solve this one. Now let's just rewrite it a bit, just uh, defining some dimensionless parameters. Now let us uh, define k to be pi over a, some k tilde. Uh, let's define e as pi squared over 2m a squared. Now oh, this is e. Some kappa tilde squared. So if we make these definitions, the eigenvalue equation just becomes minus lambda over a, 1 over pi squared over 2m a squared sum over all L, or this is not m, this is L 1 over k tilde plus L squared minus kappa tilde squared this should be equal to 1 Well, let's see, first of all, are there any <coughs> solutions to this equation? Can we see whether there are any solutions to, for this equation for a given value of k? Or how many of them are there? Well, let's see how the left-hand side looks like as a function of kappa, kappa tilde. The left-hand side... <coughs> Let's just call it f is a function of kappa tilde and k tilde. This is equal to minus uh, 2ma over lambda pi squared sum over l 1 over k tilde plus l squared minus kappa tilde squared. So we want to solve for kappa uh, <coughs> for a given value of k. That would allow us to determine the energies. And they are, they are related by this relation. This is what we need to solve. Now, if you look at F, <coughs> there are certain points at which it diverges. So let's say F kappa tilde and K, this is equal to plus infinity. If kappa tilde is equal to k tilde plus, let's call it L0, squared. 
and it goes to plus infinity if it is uh, slightly larger than this one. Because if this is satisfied, then one term diverges and it becomes minus infinity. The coefficient, if lambda is positive, the coefficient is a negative number, so it goes to plus infinity at these values. Kappa tilde squared. And it goes to minus infinity if kappa tilde squared is equal to k, k tilde plus L0 squared minus 0 plus. <coughs> so there are all these values. You see, for each given value of L, for each k tilde, there are infinitely many values of uh, kappa tilde for which the function on the left diverges. It goes to plus infinity and minus infinity. And it is con it's a continuous function in between. <coughs> so if you would plot it f as a function of kappa tilde, there are certain values at which it diverges, it goes to plus infinity, certain other values, it goes to minus infinity. It is basically such a function. And of course, at certain values of, uh, <coughs> of kappa tilde, it is equal to 1. This is one. So this is one again value. This is another one. This is another one. This is another one. And as you change k, these eigen, these, <coughs> these graphs, these di these points where it diverges also shifts around. So the uh, the point that these lines cross the one line, f is equal to one line, they they would also shift around a bit. So we do have many eigen values. Now let's try to <coughs> be more precise on what are the possible eigenvalues of this, uh, at least in this description it seems that all the eigenvalues seems to be possible because if you, as you change k, the vertical lines will be shifting continuously and as they shift continuously it seems that <coughs> k tilde can take any value as you change k. Now we will see that that is not actually the case. Now of course for, to do that we have to carry out this summation. <coughs> Now, to do that summation, what you do is you can get, just go to the library, uh, pick up a book on the mathematical formulas and look for such summations. Or you can just go to Mathematica and ask it what that sum is. I hope I didn't erase it. Well, okay. Let's ask Mathematica what the sum is. We are summing of 1 over k tilde plus L squared plus kappa tilde squared L from minus infinity to infinity I forgot some signs somewhere. Let's say this is M. Well, the sum is an analytical function. Well, let me just enlarge it a bit. This is the sum. Is everything correct? Ah, 
but here there is the sign is minus. Sorry. Okay, so this is this is the sum that we have. So f is equal to pi times sine two pi kappa tilde. divided by kappa tilde cosine 2 pi <coughs> times kappa tilde minus cosine 2 pi times k, k tilde. Well, let's see how it looks like. Let's check if our guess was correct. Well, this is how it looks like. Well, let me just... Uh... Now, these vertical lines, <laughs> it's just some numerical artifact, so it's just, it, it shouldn't connect the, uh, the point that goes to infinity and to the point that goes to minus infinity, ignore these points. So you see that it's just basically, <coughs> it's the other way around, but basically the idea is the same. It just diverges at certain points. Here there is, it diverges, here it diverges, and it, it continues smoothly. Now if you change k, let's see how it changes. So there is basically, I mean, not all of them are moving in the same direction, basically. Now let's see what are the possible values. <coughs> now of course this is, this is not f, this is just the sum. Our f is this one multiplied by this coefficient over here. This is the f. So let's just call this coefficient over here minus one over beta. Basically, beta and lambda they are the same thing. It, it's just a measure of the strength of the Dirac deltas. So what we would like to find is a. Well, let me cancel these ones also. We would like to find the solution of sine two pi k tilde divided by kappa tilde cosine two pi kappa tilde minus cosine 2 pi k tilde. This is equal to minus beta. <coughs> we are looking for solutions of this equation. Now remember kappa gives us the energy, k is the kind of the uh, quantum number that specifies this, the eigenvalue under translations by multiples of a. Now let's just try to con collect all the kappa terms and the k terms on different sides. So sine of 2 pi kappa tilde, this is equal to minus beta kappa tilde times cosine of 2 pi kappa tilde minus cosine of 2 pi k tilde. 
Well, you, you already see here that this function f has many divergence so just looking at the denominator. Whenever kappa tilde is e cosine 2 pi kappa tilde is equal to cosine 2 pi k tilde, for a given t k tilde, this equation has infinitely many solutions, so you have infinitely many poles. Now, if we simplify this equation, what we would get is cosine 2 pi k tilde. This should be equal to <coughs> cosine 2 pi kappa tilde plus 1 over beta kappa tilde times sine of 2 pi kappa tilde. <coughs> this is the equation we have that relates the energy to the quantum number k. Now, note that the left-hand side <coughs> is cosine 2 pi k tilde, which is something between minus 1 and 1. So should the right-hand side be between minus 1 and 1? So this, this, this is the condition that the energies should satisfy. If this condition is satisfied, then we know the corresponding uh, wave vector k. So there's an eigen energy. <coughs> well, let's see what that function looks, looks like. This is cosine 2 kappa p, cosine 2, well, I just ignore the tildes, 2 pi kappa p plus, let me erase this, pi sine 2 kappa p divided by beta kappa. I'm just plotting it as a function of kappa for various values of beta. So this is for beta minus 3. Let's, think, let's change the value of beta. <coughs> well, you see, you already see that. I mean, can you see it? You see that here, the top, the peak value is already above beta is equal to, uh, above uh, the value 1 and it goes below the value minus 1. So the kappa just cannot take those values. <coughs> so if you would just plot this function, If you plot it, it's, just, it's an oscillating function. And depending on the parameters, its maximum is above 1, its minimum below minus 1. But we already know that <coughs> that function for the eigenvalues, that function has to be between 1 and minus 1. So basically, the kappa can take any value in this region. It can take any value. Well, in this region. Or in this region. So basically, these are what we call our bands. For a given, <coughs> now each one of these, well, you see, if you just, this value over here, 
pick that value. Now, picking a horizontal value means you are picking some value of k. For a given value of k, you have many possible energy values. But those energy values always lie in various bands. For a given k, you can have many states having the same value of k but different energies. We just say that they are in different bands. Now, if we have a free particle, can't we do the same thing? Uh, the free particle, the potential is symmetric with respect to any translation, so we can just pick some A and say that the potential is, is symmetric with respect to transitions of this A. So we should be obtaining the same thing, the same band structure, basically. Hmm? No. Which K? Well, kappa we can define it to be positive. Remember, energy is proportional to kappa squared. <coughs> so K can be negative, you are right. I mean, K can, since K is negative, this sign can be both negative or positive. So it can give such a K, uh, sine 2 pi K tilde, or such a sine 2 pi K tilde. But the question is, <coughs> we can treat the zero potential as a symmetric potential, as a potential symmetric with respect to transitions with respect to A. A being some arbitrary number. You can choose A to be zero, but you can also choose A to be non-zero. It's just an arbitrary choice. <coughs> in that case, we should be able to do the same thing in that case. So how do we have the bands? Really? Well, let's see. I mean, <coughs> just remember something. K is always defined to be between pi over A and minus pi over A. We said that this is the Brillouin zone that we are considering. Now, for <coughs> if the potential is zero, we have this, the particle can have an arbitrary momentum. But if you say that the particle has a momentum K, in this description at least, or saying that the particle has momentum k minus 2 pi over a, they, are basic, they basically correspond to the same k for a free particle. So you can shift your momentum by multiples of 2 pi over a and make sure that it comes back within this range. So that is basically why you are having this band structure. This is K. This is the, let's say, the energy. Well, for a free particle, we know that the energy of a free particle is h bar squared K squared over 2m. And it basically looks like this one. This is the shape. So what we do, this is, let's say, this is pi over a, this is minus pi over a. And then we say that, okay, this is 3 pi over a, and here we have minus 3 pi over a. Now, we already had said that we can just change the value of k by multiples of 2 pi over a. It gives me the same value. The same, it corresponds to the same k in this block theorem. Well, if I do that, I'm basically carrying this one over here. I take this one. and shift it over here. No. This is just parallel to this one. 
Торе. And I can do the same thing for the other one. For this one, it can take any eigenvalue in this range. If I shift it, it just becomes this one. No. Okay, sorry. Now we have these bands. This is the first band. This is the second band, this region. Of course, of course, now the bands are overlapping. Not, over, not overlapping, but they're, they're just continuous. There's no gap between the bands for the free particle. Now, what actually happens is when you turn on the potential, <coughs> at these points, at these junctions where you have these, uh, the bands meet, they just try start to split. So you start having band gaps. Now the thing is that this K appearing in the Bloch moment Bloch theorem. This K over here is not really the three momentum. It's three momentum of the particle up to multiples of two pi over A. So that's why even <coughs> in this uh, description, let's say, even for the free particle, we, we get all these band, band structure. So but what we mean by a particle that is in the second band, in this band over here, somewhere over here, in this energy band, it's just it's a particle that has a larger linear moment. You just add. 2 pi a over k or subtract. And then you have the, all the higher bands. So it's the band quantum number in a sense which tells you what is the exact linear momentum of the particle. Now then of course you can just complicate this, this picture here. If you remember we have just a sing, single particle, single electron in a uniform the space Dirac delta potential, you can assume a more realistic potential like the Coulomb potential, which will basically look like just a sum of poles. You should also take into account the electron-electron interactions at least to some extent. And so the band structure becomes really complicated, but the basic idea is just this one. And then you can use this theorem, <coughs> this band gap. And in fact, these, this behavior of the bands is what tell, tells us a lot about the electronic properties of the material. So for example, let's say that you have a material, you have all the electrons. Of course, the electrons, they don't want to go to the same state so that you will just start from filling the ground state and then one by one you fill all the states up to some level. <coughs> you will be filling the gaps. So let's say you have one band over here. You have another band which has a higher energy. So this, this is the energy that the electrons can have. So you just fill these bands. If this, this is the configuration that you have, <coughs> So basically, you have filled one gap. There is a second gap above, but that is kind of <coughs> already having a much larger energy. So this is what's, uh, what makes an object an insulator. Because if you want to have a conductor, what you have to do is you have to somehow put some of the electrodes in a higher energy state. But in this case, the higher the energy that is necessary is equal to this band gap. So unless you can provide your system with such an energy, the electrons will not be moving. 
So by just applying a very small potential wouldn't be enough to create a uh, sufficient, wouldn't be able to transfer sufficient energy to start the electrons moving. Of course, if you apply to uh, insulators some potential difference of some thousand volts, you will have the electron electric breakdown, and what happens in the electric breakdown is you are actually transferring that the energy that is analogous to this uh, energy in the band cap. And then you can have other systems which might be similar. At least it looks similar. But this time the electrons are only at that level. The electron that has the highest energy has this energy. By the, by, by the way, this, the electron with the higher energy is called the Fermi energy. <coughs> so you fill all the levels up to a given Fermi energy, and this time the Fermi energy just lies within a band. Now, in this case, of course, just a very small amount of energy. If you give a very small amount of energy to an electron, it will just jump to higher <coughs> energies within the higher states within the same band. So basically, you can transfer as little energy as you like, and the electron will be excited, and it will start moving. So this is what we call a conductor. And now we have the semiconductors. <coughs> they basically look like insulators in the sense that you have the one of the bands is almost completely filled, but the band gap is small. They're not so, so good conductors in their pure form, but what you do is you just kind of you can add impurities which have one more one extra electron or one less electron and hence create holes either create holes in the lower band or create <coughs> uh, extra electrons in the higher band uh, so they will be free to move because they are, there there are uh, empty spaces in the band where there are electrons so you can you will be able to transfer energy to them and so you can control their conduction properties easily by just changing slightly their uh, composition so this is, this, these are the semiconductors. Any questions on these? I would say both of them are correct. I mean, this is, this will make a conductor because you can. I mean, there are states just above the Fermi level that are <coughs> that you can excite your electron. This is also a conductor if you just fill this band, let's say. I mean, both. Well, what determines the, whether it's a conductor or not is basically where is the Fermi level. So if it is in an empty region where you don't have any, it's, it's, if it lies within an energy gap, band gap, then you cannot have, it's, it's an insulator. If it lies within a band, whether either because this lies in the middle of a band or if it just lies between two bands that are touching each other, and in both cases you get conductors. Questions? <coughs> well, to obtain this eigenvalue equation, if you remember what we had done, okay, we said, okay, this, this was what we had done. So we just considered the series expansion of the wave function in terms of the plane waves, and then we obtained this one. <coughs> well, there's an easier way of obtaining the same eigenvalue equation. And that is basically using the fact that 
psi of x plus a this is equal to e to the power i kx times ka times psi of x. So if we just solve it within one period, then we know the wave function everywhere. So we have the Dirac delta that v was equal to lambda times Dirac delta x minus a n. So let's say for x between 0 and a, v is equal to 0. And so <coughs> minus h bar squared over 2m psi double prime, this should be equal to h bar squared k kappa squared over 2m psi. This is our e. So psi <coughs> double prime is equal to minus kappa squared psi or psi is equal to a times cosine kappa x plus b times sine kappa x. So this is our psi. So this is psi of x if x is between 0 and 8. Now, if x is between, let's say, a and 2a, then we know that psi of x is equal to e to the power i k times a psi of x minus a. No, this is minus. But then if x is between a and 2a, then x minus a is between 0 and a. So I can use the above relation. So this is equal to e to the power minus a k a times a times cosine kappa x minus a plus b times sine kappa x plus a sorry minus a. Well, one of these constants is arbitrary. It just fixes the normalization. You can just choose A to be 1 or whatever you like. So we basically have two unknowns. We don't know kappa. We don't know A over B or B over A. So we need two equations for the, to determine the eigenvalues. One of them will be the continuity of the wave function. at x is equal to a, it should be continuous. So it basically tells me that from the above solution, <coughs> I can just take the limit as x going to a, and the wave function at x is equal to a is nothing but a. a cosine kappa a plus b sine kappa a. And from the lower solution, lower expression, I can just obtain that at x is equal to a, the wave function is e to the power minus a k a times a cosine kappa a. Sine term just drops. By the way, this is plus. Because psi of x is equal to psi of x minus a plus a. And this is our translation. If you translate by a, we said that the phase is e to the power i k a. So this is the continuity of the wave function. And this gives us a relation between a and b. And then we have the discontinuity of the derivative of the wave function. 
because of this Dirac delta, there is a discontinuity there. And at x is equal to a, now this is equal to if x is, let's say, between a over 2, So it is, oh, sorry, that's just A. There is no cosine. You are right. You see, this is the, when I put x is equal to A, I get cosine 0 and sine 0. Cosine 0 is 1, sine 0 is 0. Now, <coughs> if x is close to A, this is our potential. So the minus h bar squared over 2m, the second derivative of psi, plus lambda Dirac delta x minus a, this should be equal to e times psi. Just integrate both sides over x from 0 minus to 0 plus, now a minus to a plus, from the left of a to the right of a. Then we get minus h bar squared over 2m psi prime, evaluate that x is equal to 0 plus a plus, minus psi prime at x is equal to a minus plus lambda times psi at x is equal to a this should be equal to zero And the derivatives, <coughs> well, basically, this is what the wave function looks like when x is lar when x is at a plus. So if you take the derivative, uh, it becomes e to power i k a Now, if you take the derivative, sine becomes a cosine, cosine becomes a sine. Well, sine doesn't contribute. So this a term doesn't really contribute to the derivative at x is equal to a. It's only the b term that will contribute to the derivative at x is equal to a, and its contribution will be just b times kappa times the cosine, which just gives me 1. This is the derivative at x is equal to a plus. Minus the derivative at x is equal to a minus, this is our solution when x is equal to a minus to the left of a, x is equal to a. If you take the derivative, we get a times kappa. Well, both of them gives a kappa. Minus a sine kappa a plus b cosine kappa a. This should be equal to zero. Or let's just rewrite it, minus a sine of kappa a plus b cosine of kappa a, this should be equal to b times e to the power i k a. This is our second equation. And this is our first equation. And if you just solve these equations, <coughs> you will basically obtain our previous eigenvalue expression. This one. So it will just give you the same answer. It should. But at least we don't we didn't have to worry about these infinite series, etc. So what we did was we just solved within one cell, let's say, one cell that repeats. And then by just using this block theorem to translate it to different cells and matching the value of the, potent, the wave function and its derivative at the boundaries, we obtain the eigenvalue equations. Now, if you generalize it to three dimensions, things start getting more complicated. But the basic idea is A 
again you have the R <coughs> of course since we are talking about in solids we will be talking about some uh, lattices a lattice is something that repeats itself if you translate it by let's say M A1 plus N A2 plus L A3 so if you take your potential if you translate it by these vectors A1, A2, A3 you get the same potential then the block theorem is basically <coughs> the same it just tells you that if you translate your wave function by one of these uh, objects let's say a then this is e to power i k this time it will be a three dimensional object that a times psi r and <coughs> now this basically tells us that this wave function is equal to e to power i k dot r times u of r where u is periodic and this k can take any value and you will still get the band structure but of course it's, uh, it becomes more complicated and if you are interested this is the course where you should go Well, this is the uh, condensed matter one and two. The second one we no, I mean, th this is the basics. So it's in 409. Okay. Okay, any questions? So, what would you like to do on Friday? Okay, that is always we can do. Now, one thing <coughs> I would like to discuss is just such a I mean, short description of maybe some relativistic mechanics. Light reflection, quantum mechanical light reflection. Not in two hours. Well, just think of electromagnetism as the quantum mechanics of the light. The, the, the potentials that you find are nothing but the wave functions of the photon. So if you find the classical uh, solutions of the uh, Maxwell's equation for a reflected light, then you have the wave function of a photon. Well, the relativistic equations do involve the, <coughs> the wave functions of the photon, by the way. Basically, the question is this one. The Schrodinger equation, when we were writing the Schrodinger equation, we started by saying that the energy is equal to p squared over 2m plus v of r. This is not true in <coughs> relativistic mechanics. So we have to modify this. E squared should be equal to P squared C squared plus M squared C to the 4. And from here you get the Klein-Gordon equation. And if you set M is equal to 0, the wave equation for electromagnetic waves but then now we have this problem though you see in the time dependent Schrodinger equation the energy was first order so the time dependent Schrodinger equation is first order in time now in this relativistic formulation we just increase the order so now since the uh, coordinate is second order in time so we have to make the 
equation second order no, the, it's second order in coordinate so we had to make it second order in time also but then if you want to solve an equation that is second order in time you need to have two initial conditions it's not enough to know the wave function at t equal to zero well one alternative way is how can we obtain an equation that is first order in time and first order in coordinates and that is the Dirac equation Yeah, we will, I, will, I will just go it's fast, just an overview of what they are, so that you will be at least you have heard of them. And with the Dirac equation, spin is inevitable. They're not solutions of Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams, you derive them from Dirac equation. Okay, so see you on Friday.